My name is John Moyer. Welcome to Gap. I'm the Gap webinar series. The series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to promote the use of the best available methods and to support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. You can submit questions during the webinar using the Q&A pod in the lower right. We will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via WebEx at the conclusion of today's talk. The slides and video recording will be posted on our website, prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap in approximately two weeks. You'll receive an email when they are available. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David M. Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moyer. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Carla Hemming, Professor of Biostatistics at the Institute of Applied Health Research, the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. Dr. Hemming's research interests include how to design cluster and step wedge trials to maximize their statistical efficiency and minimize their risk of bias, how to model time and treatment effect heterogeneity in longitudinal cluster trials, and the ethical issues surrounding these pragmatic trial designs, such as ethical oversight and consent. Dr. Hemming recently led the consort extension for the step wedge cluster randomized trial. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Carla Hemming. Thank you, David. Um, so thank you everybody for attending. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to give this talk today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the sort of the settings where the stepped wedge cluster randomized trial uh, might be a good study design choice. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge Monica Talliard. Um, much of this work has been um, um, done in collaboration with Monica, and most of the work that I'm going to present here was published in um, IJE in 2020. Okay, so I thought I might start with a setting the scene a little bit, thinking about the first step to edge cluster randomized design. Um, the first stepped wedge trial that we know of um, was set in the Gambia. Um, it was a nationwide evaluation of the HBV vaccine. Um, and in the Gambia, they rolled out this vaccine program in a phased, but also random way over a four year period from 1986 to 1990, um, trying to reduce the outcome essentially of liver cancer. And their outcomes were ascertained by National Cancer Registry very long term follow up, 30 years follow up. Um, the study actually hasn't actually reported yet. So on the right hand side, you can see a schematic representation of the study design. Um, the 17 clusters in this situation represent the 17 geographical areas of the Gambia. It covered the entire country of the Gambia. And over the four year period, each of these regions were randomly assigned to transition so from that point onwards, all of the babies born in that particular region received the HBV vaccine. So over those four years of the study period, 61,000 infants approximately were born into a region where the vaccine program had been rolled out and say so they were vaccinated. And about 63,000 infants were born at a time when their region had not yet transitioned to the vaccination program. And so they didn't receive the vaccination. And in that paper published um, way back in 1987, the investigators said that they adopted this type of trial design because instantaneous and universal vaccination wasn't possible for logistical and financial reasons. And what I want to do today in the talk is to think about what is an appropriate justification for adopting the step wedge design. And at the very end of the talk, I'll come back and do a sort of mini critical appraisal of this justification here. So before I start, I wanted to introduce a bit of terminology that I'm going to use. 
I'm going to talk about clusters being allocated to sequences. So in this schematic here, I've got eight clusters and the eight clusters have been allocated to one of four sequences. And then measurements are taken at different periods in the study design. <clears throat> so I can think about clusters and also cluster periods. And then every time that a cluster transitions to the intervention condition, that's called a step. And this terminology was introduced in the consort statement for stepped wedge designs. So what I want to do in this talk today is to think about what is a good justification for adopting the stepped wedge trial. But before I do that, I want to motivate, why do we need to have a justification for a particular study design? Why does it matter? Why can't we just adopt, adopt any old randomized trial design? So what I want to do here is to think about, well, what are the different risks of bias that are associated with the different study designs? I'll think firstly about what are the risks of bias associated with parallel cluster trials, and then move on to think about what are the additional risks of bias in a stepped wedge trial? What I hope to do is hypothesize that the stepped wedge trial is at a greater risk of bias from the parallel design, and so therefore its use needs to be um, justified. And then after that, I'm going to go on to think about what are a set of justifications for when it might be a good trial design choice compared to the parallel design. And then finally, at the very end, I'll think about some common misconceptions about when this trial design is a good choice. So the popularity of the stepped wedge design is clearly growing. This is a plot that shows the number of citations of stepped wedge, um, according to PubMed, up to February 2021. And we can clearly see that over the past 10 years or so, the number of um, studies citing um, stepped wedge has really started to increase. Why are people adopting it? Why are they using it? Well, in a review published in 2017 um, of stepped wedge trials that had been published up to that date, um, reported reasons for adopting the justification are presented here. So interestingly, many people or many reports didn't actually give a justification for adopting the trial design. So 38% of stepped wedge trials don't give any justification for choosing it. But common justifications where they are reported or that all sites might get the intervention, that there are sort of resource constraints. The stepped wedge trial is perceived to be beneficial because it allows the staggering of the rollout of this intervention or evaluation. Other reasons cited are the ethical advantages that the stepped wedge trial might bring and methodological advantages, power. So I'm going to think through today when these are good um, justifications and hopefully um, try to um, suggest that some of these might not be appropriate justifications in many settings. So why do we need to have careful justification? Well, any research that we do has to have some sort of scientific and social value. And if it's going to have scientific value, it has to produce reliable information. And for a study to produce reliable and valid information, it has to be at low risk of bias. So how do we assess risk of bias in any particular type of study design? Well, the place, one place that we can start is to use the Cochrane um, guidelines for assessing risk of bias. So they published in 2016 an update of their risk of bias two tool called the ROB2 tool. And shortly after that, an adaptation of that main guidance was published for parallel cluster randomized trials. And that guidance outlines the risk of bias in parallel cluster trials according to five domains. These domains are listed here. And I'm going to think through why some of these domains are particularly important when we're carrying out cluster trials. I'm going to focus just on two of them. That's not to say that the others are not necessarily important. They can be important in different settings, but it turns out that a couple of these risks of bias domains are particularly important when we're conducting parallel cluster trials. And hopefully that will become evident over the next few slides. And I also want to think about an additional domain. This domain isn't included in the ROB2 tool, but it might be of importance when we're conducting parallel cluster trials with only a small number of clusters. And I'm calling this analytical biases. 
So for the next few slides, I'm going to think through what these biases mean, what the domains mean, and why they might be very important in parallel cluster trials. And I'll then come back to think about how these might be additionally important in stepped wedge trials. So let's start with the first one. The first one is called domain 1A. It's a bias arising from the randomization process. So in a parallel cluster trial, this randomization means or refers to the process of allocating the clusters to their arms. So biases can arise for two reasons, either because this process is not actually random or because it's not adhered to at the level of the cluster. And for a process to be truly random, it has to have two ingredients. First of all, it has to be random. But secondly, perhaps less well appreciated, it has to be concealed at the time of recruitment of clusters. And this is known as concealment of the allocation. It's different to blinding. It's often mixed up with blinding. It is related to blinding, but it's different. And this was realized to be very important in patient randomized trials back in the 1980s. But this type of randomization can, can arise. So it's usually unintentional, but even if something's unintentional, it can be, can be consequential. And essentially what it means is that somehow this is subversion of the allocation process. So although it's ra it, it is truly random at source, it's not random when it's implemented. And in order to prevent this type of randomization bias, investigators need to do two things. First of all, they need to randomly allocate their clusters using some properly um, randomization method, which almost all cluster trials probably do. But they also need to make sure that the person who undertakes and implements the randomization is an independent person to the, to the trial team. So perhaps might use a trials unit or a data coordinating center. And then this randomization has to be concealed from the clusters until all of the cluster participation is ratified. And essentially what investigators need to do is to apply the same level of rigor as they would in a patient randomized trial. So that's the first type of bias that can penetrate these studies. The second one is known as bias arising from the identification or recruitment of the participants within the clusters. Now this type of bias happens when recruitment or identification of the participants to participate in the trial is done with knowledge of the treatment allocation. And if the person recruiting or identifying patients for the trial knows what the treatment allocation is, this can lead to differential recruitment and identification across the treatment conditions. So it's about internal validity, not external validity, and sometimes it's called, to, called selection bias. But I think that term's probably a little bit amb ambiguous in some settings. So let's think through what is identification and recruitment bias. So it concerns trials when there's post-randomization recruitment. That means the clusters have been allocated to their intervention or control arm, and after the clusters have been allocated, participants are recruited. And if participants are recruited with knowledge of the treatment condition, this can lead to differential recruitment across the study arms. It turns out it's probably the most important source of bias in a cluster trial. It's very hard to detect, however, so here's an example of a baseline table from a cluster trial. Big red flags that this type of bias had occurred in a trial would be differences in the numbers recruited in each of the arms, not happening in this trial, or differences in patient characteristics between treatment and control arms. Now there's some differences in this particular baseline table, 54 versus 57% in one characteristic, um, 18 versus 20 percent in another, 27 versus 19 in another, in another characteristic. But whether that's just chance imbalance or a systematic imbalance, it's very difficult to identify from one given baseline table. However, when um, researchers have a look across many baseline tables in cluster randomized designs, they identify that there are significant differences in the average age of participants between treatment and control across many cluster trials. That doesn't happen in individually randomized trials on average. There's also lots of process evidence that this type of bias occurs. And this is because many cluster trials recruit their participants after randomization. Most don't clearly report if that recruitment was blind to the allocation. 
So many cluster trials don't appear to conceal the allocation at the time of the recruitment. So there's lots of empirical evidence that this type of bias is a real problem in cluster trials. Again, it's often not intentional, but nonetheless, it can be consequential. Now, there are ways that we can prevent this type of bias. The first way that we can prevent it is to recruit all of the participants before randomization. That's not always possible, particularly in some settings. We can blind the treatment conditions. Again, not always possible. Now, if these prevention strategies won't work in your setting, then perhaps it might be questionable whether a cluster randomized design is the right choice in that setting. But if you do decide to go on and use a cluster randomized trial, then there are some mitigation strategies. So you should minimize the number of eligibility criteria, only include objective eligibility criteria, and then recruit, if all possible, by somebody who's blind to the cluster status. This minimizes the recruitment bias. So those are the prevention strategies. The final domain I wanted to think about, remembering this isn't an official domain in the ROB2 tool, is what I'm calling analytical biases. So analytical biases refer to any bias that we might get when we're trying to estimate our treatment effect and its confidence interval, because in some way we've misspecified the statistical model. Now we're all familiar with how cluster trials need to allow for the clustered nature of the design, Less widely appreciated is that when we've got a small number of clusters, we have to make what is known as a small sample correction. Essentially use a t-test on k minus two degrees of freedom, where k is our number of clusters. Most investigators and trialists don't realize that, and many cluster trials are, are published without using the small sample correction. We can consider this as a sort of fixable fault. We don't have to necessarily think about it at the planning stage, but it is data greedy. So those are the main risks of bias um, that are prevalent in cluster randomized trial. And this chart here shows the results of a review of 40 randomly sampled cluster trials published over the last 10 years. And it illustrates the proportion of cluster trials that are at high risk of bias and low risk of bias according to the five different domains. So the five different domains are on the left hand side. The first one is the randomization process. And of these 40 trials, around 50% um, of them were assessed as high risk of bias um, according to the, to, to the randomization domain. Um, and then interestingly, about 70% of these trials were assessed as high risk of bias because of a risk of identifying and recruiting participants after randomization. Other biases tend to be, tended to be less prevalent, although noticeable a bias that I haven't spoken about just was selection of reported result. So about half of the trials were assessed as being at high risk of bias on this domain probably because they're not registering the um, trials on um, trial registration databases or in some way not pre-specifying a single primary outcome and a single primary assessment time. But this illustrates then that cluster randomized trials can be at high risk of bias. And so if we're adopting a cluster randomized design, it's important to think about an appropriate justification. Do we need a cluster trial in our particular setting, given many of these biases wouldn't be an issue in a patient randomized design? So moving on then, um, what I want to do over the next few slides is to think about how these risks of bias might as, uh, uh, affect a stepped wedge cluster randomized design. So there's no formal adoption of the ROB2 tool for stepped wedge trials, but over the next few slides, I'll outline what I think are some of the important extra considerations that make this design at risk of bias. So it's becoming increasingly common, and although it shares many of its characteristics with parallel cluster designs and other repeated measures designs, it brings about some significant complexities. So the first of these is what I'm calling temporal confounding. The second is something called within cluster contamination. 
and the third is called deviations from the randomization. And over the next few slides, I'll go through each of these in turn, think about how they relate to the different domains under the ROB2 tool, and think about why they can be particularly important in stepped wedge trials. So the first one is what I'm calling analytical biases. And in a stepped wedge trial, it might be better thought of as a temporal bias. So remember that the analytical approach that we choose to use has to give us an unbiased estimate of our treatment effect and its standard error. Now, in a stepped wedge trial, this is complicated by the fact that there may be underlying changes over time, which we might call secular trends, and they might confound the intervention effect. So we might have an apparent effect due to the intervention, but actually it might just be a natural change over time. So that's the first complication. And the second is that we need to get our standard errors right. And within cluster correlations, probably need to take a more complicated form than the simple exchangeable correlation structure that we commonly adopt within a parallel setting. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the bias that we might get in our estimation of the treatment effect. So why is time a confounder? Well, remember, time, a variable is a confounder if it's associated with both the treatment and the outcome. And if we think about the way that we design our stepped wedge trials, by, tie, by design, time is a confounder. So we see that our intervention observations are collected systematically later than the control observations. And this means that the likelihood of the treatment increases with time. And if the outcome also changes over time in absence of any intervention, we call this a secular trend, then time will be a confounder in the study. So the next example will illustrate why this can be problematic. So these are the results from a stepped wedge trial where the outcome was the percentage of women who had a membrane sweep and percentage women swept. And it was hoped that this percentage would increase. So under the control condition, about 45% of the women <clears throat> had a membrane sweep. After the intervention was rolled out, about 47% of the women had a membrane sweep. So it looks like there's a positive effect of this intervention. It looks like the proportion or percentage is increasing after rollout of the intervention. And the adjusted relative risk point estimate was 1.06, suggesting a positive effect. But actually what was happening was that there was a natural tendency for this proportion or percentage of women to be swept to increase over time. And this is illustrated in the right hand plot by the black line, which is a secular trend in the control clusters. So this is just a plot of what's happening in the control clusters in absence of any intervention. So even with doing nothing in those control clusters, the percentage of women who were being swept was increasing over time. The red, is the adjusted for time intervention effect. And we can see that when we've adjusted for time, the point estimate now goes below one, it's 0.88. And this is now suggesting that the intervention is having a harmful effect. It's not going in the right direction. And adjustment for time reverses the apparent direction of the effect. So this is why time effects are so important in stepped wedge trials. An intervention that looks effective can actually transpire to be not effective after we've adjusted for time. But in order to adjust for time, we have to make a number of what we might call model based assumptions. So on the left hand side, the black lines represent three different clusters. Um, and this is the assumed um, outcome in those different clusters over time under the control condition. Intervention comes along, the intervention shifts the outcome in each of the clusters illustrated by the red lines. Now, when we model our treatment effects, we make a number of assumptions. First of all, we assume that the treatment effect is the same across all of the clusters. Maybe we're happy that we're interested in an average effect. We assume that the effect is the same over time. Maybe we're happy in, in, in estimating the average treatment effect over time. But we also make another assumption. We make the assumption that the secular trend, i.e. the pattern in the black lines, is the same across all of the clusters. But this is an untenable assumption, and it's an assumption that might not be tenable in many situations. And what's more, we can't test it. 
we can't test that our clusters all follow that same secular trend because we haven't got enough data to do that. And it's worthy of noting that these types of biases and assumptions aren't something that are likely to affect parallel cluster trials. We don't make these assumptions. It's not necessary to make them when we're evaluating interventions in a parallel cluster trial. So this turns out to be a real problem. There are a number of ways that we can prevent these analytical biases. At the design stage, we can randomize a large number of clusters. That's probably going to help a lot. We can also randomize more homogeneous clusters to try to meet the assumption of a common secular trend. The other thing that we can do is at the analysis stage, we should always adjust for secular trends and also allow for these non-exchangeable correlation structures to make sure that we're getting the standard error right. We might have to think about using permutation tests when we're making assumptions that are questionable, especially with a small number of clusters. And should we always adjust for time? Well, in a recent paper, um, we provided the advice that actually investigators should adjust for time and they should adjust for time because of logical reasoning rather than try to test whether time effects were significant or not significant. So that's the first added risk of bias in a stepped wedge design. The second added risk is what I'm calling deviations or it comes under the domain deviations from the intended intervention. And it essentially represents a within cluster carry uh, contamination, perhaps better um, termed or known as a carryover effect. And it essentially refers to the bias that we might get because we collect data under the control condition and it becomes contaminated with the intervention condition or vice versa. Because remember in these cluster trials, all of the clusters will eventually get the intervention. So this means that there's a risk of contamination. And this type of contamination can occur at two levels. It can occur at the level of the individual or the level of the cluster. So at the level of the individual, uh, uh, sorry, at the level of the cluster, this contamination can occur because a provider or a cluster might be in the control condition, but for some reason they start to the in implement the intervention before their allocated time. Or it could happen the other way around. A provider or a cluster might have already crossed over to the intervention condition, but for some reason they continue applying the control condition. So that's at the level of the cluster. At the level of the individual, it can happen because sometimes participants might have quite a long exposure to the intervention. For example, they might be in an intensive care unit. And if they also have a, long, a prolonged exposure to the intervention um, and then they're still under the care of the intensive care unit after that cluster has crossed to the intervention, it's possible that their observations might become contaminated with the intervention condition. So that's how it can happen at the level of the individual. We can um, try to prevent this within cluster contamination using transition periods, careful designs, and also in trials where participants have a short exposure to the intervention, this type of bias is less likely to occur. But again, it's worth noting that this type of bias probably doesn't happen in cluster trials because clusters don't transition between the treatment conditions or parallel cluster trials, I should have said. The third type of bias um, that can happen in these step wedge trials um, is what we call randomization bias. And essentially, remember, this is about the non-adherence to the allocation schedule. And it turns out to be particularly problematic in stepped wedge trials because some clusters are deemed as needy. Um, they need to go first or clusters might join um, the trial and be ready to be randomized at different points in time. Now, people have proposed, proposed prevention strategies. For example, has been suggested that revealing the allocation as late as possible might prevent anticipation dropout, or others have suggested revealing the allocation as early as possible might help. But there's no um, real evidence behind either of these different strategies. Although recently, um, a a design called the batched stepped wedge design has been presented, has been suggested, which is illustrated on the right hand side here. And this type of design does allow more needy clusters to go early, but again, it's data greedy. 
but that might be a potential solution to this problem. So summary so far then, stepped wedge trails are at several risks of bias. This type of bias might challenge the strength of the evidence that's generated from this design. Now, some of these biases um, are common in different types of parallel cluster trials and other repeated measure types of designs, but many of them appear to be greater under the stepped wedge design. So therefore, use of the stepped wedge design has to be very carefully considered. So what I want to do finally then is think through four possible justifications for when the stepped wedge design might be a good design choice. None of them are intended to be hard and fast rules. And often, in fact, these apparent justifications don't stand up to scrutiny. And the more that are satisfied, the more likely that the stepped wedge design is the right choice. So if only one of them is stepped wedge is satisfied, then perhaps it's not the right design. And then finally, I'll outline um, a couple of misconceptions. So what do we need to justify and why do we need to justify using a stepped wedge design? Well, we need to justify the use of cluster randomization, the need to roll out the intervention to all of the clusters, and the need for this staggered rollout of the intervention condition. Now, in what follows, I'm not going to consider justification for using cluster randomization, but hopefully it's implicit in what's come at the beginning of this talk that we should have a good justification for using cluster randomization. So assuming that cluster randomization is necessary, then thinking through why stepped wedge design might be preferable or justified over and above a parallel design. So let's just remind ourselves of why justification is needed. Well, mainly we have to carry out this model-based analysis. And these assumptions underpinning these models might not be appropriate. They're very hard to test, especially in the small number of clusters setting. So that's the first reason, and that's around the risk of bias. But there are other reasons, not necessarily linked to risk of bias, but to do with logistics and feasibility. So stepped wedge design is often cited as being a feasible type of study design to implement, but actually in practice, it's a more complicated in its design. And often the study can fail to deliver on its objectives because of these added complexities of getting all the clusters to do what you want them to do at the right point in time. And then the other issue is, is that the stepped wedge design means rolling out this intervention to all of the clusters. And this might mean increasing the number of individuals or the number of clusters that are exposed to an intervention of unknown effectiveness. And so this can lead to an increase in the risk of harm, um, compa perhaps compared to a parallel design. So those are the three reasons why justification is needed. So it's not just all about bias. So the first justification um, that we proposed is that the stepped wedge design might pro provide the means to do a randomized evaluation. And without this design choice, a randomized evaluation wouldn't be possible. So we all know that interventions are often rolled out with any robust evaluation, but sometimes this rollout might be sequential, perhaps because of a limited resources or minimal capacity to roll out this intervention to the entire, entire healthcare system simultaneously. Or it might be because a gradual rollout allows the possibility to tweak the intervention as it's rolled out and then it's adapted as more is learnt. So if stakeholders can be convinced in this type of setting to randomize the order of the rollout, then the stepped wedge design would allow us a means to evaluate this intervention using randomization. However, if the stakeholders can be convinced of the benefit of randomizing the order of the rollout, then it might also be possible to convince them of the benefit of randomizing under a parallel design. So the second potential justification is that it facilitates cluster recruitment. So sometimes stakeholders are very reluctant to participate in a trial unless they're guaranteed to receive the intervention. They perceive this intervention, whatever it is, as a good thing and they want it. So these desires and a priori beliefs mean that sometimes it's more likely that clusters will participate under a stepped wedge design than under a parallel design. 
But if this is going to be a justification, then researchers really should attempt to ensure that this is the truth and it's actually how the stakeholders feel. And so when determining whether or not the stakeholders and clusters would participate in both types of designs or just one, they should be fully informed about the alternatives, such as the parallel design and the weightless design. And in particular, they should be informed about the benefits of the parallel design over and above the stepped wedge design. Justification three is that it creates a logistically feasible design. So often there can be limited resources or capacity to roll out this intervention to all of the health systems at the same time. For example, under a parallel design, it might be necessary to roll this intervention out to 10 clusters at the same time, and stakeholders might say this is just simply not feasible. So the sequential roller in a stepped wedge trial can then be appealing, but it brings about its own logistical issues. So you have to organize all of the research ethics approvals so that all of the clusters can start at the same point in time, at least under the conventional stepped wedge design. Um, and actually also a parallel design can be conducted in a staggered way. So the illustration in the bottom of this um, slide here illustrates how a parallel design can be run in a staggered way. So the green represents the control condition, the orange, the intervention condition, and the staggering here represents how the clusters have come on board sequentially and the intervention, the orange bit, is rolled out sequentially over time. So it is possible to run a parallel design in a sequential way too. And then the final justification is that the stepped wedge design has increased statistical power. Now this can be true, it does depend on the setting, it depends on how many clusters are, there are, what the outcome is, is it binary or continuous, how big the clusters are, what the intracluster correlation is, and so on. In sometimes, particularly in settings with a small number of clusters, it turns out that 80 or 90% power might not be achievable under a parallel design, but it is under a stepped wedge design. So this is the one of the settings where the stepped wedge trial has a, an appeal. However, at the same time, if we are in the setting of a small number of clusters, it might look to be more powerful. But in that setting, we're also at greater risk of these analytical biases. Small sample corrections have to be used. We cannot be sure that the assumptions that we make when we're modeling our data are tenable and appropriate in that setting. So it looks like this is an appealing justification, but it also has its own disadvantages. Other considerations are things like how long does the study need to run for? So many times when we're running these types of trials, we have to ensure that the study comes in within the funder's time frame. Stepped wedge trials look like they take a longer duration. In practice, it actually depends on the own on different particular settings about whether the parallel design or the stepped wedge tr trial design will be longer or shorter. The other thing to think about is how long it's going to take to realize the effect of the intervention. So the intervention needs to have time to start working and affect the outcomes before we start taking measurements. If this takes a long time, particularly in the setting of complex interventions, then that may, may mean that the stepped wedge trial design might be become a very long duration, so it might not be a good choice in that type of setting. Finally then, um, misconception. So early on in the history of the step wedge design, um, the most commonly reported reason for adopting this design choice was something along the lines of it's ethically more appropriate when the intervention is expected to do more harm than good. But borrowing this graphic here from Richard Hooper, um, so if we think that the stepped wedge trial um, is a good choice, we think there's a strong ethical argument to give everyone the intervention, then actually the response to that should be, well, we should give everyone the intervention. Why are we evaluating it if we already know it works? So was the Gambia study well justified? Remember, their justification was that the instantaneous and universal vaccination in the country was impossible for logistical and financial reasons. So let's think through this very briefly. Was cluster randomization necessary? Was an individual level intervention 
puts the design at quite high risk of um, bias, but they were interested in direct, indirect effects. So arguably cluster randomization was necessary. Was the stepped wedge added component necessary? Well, there was already evidence of effectiveness in other settings. And so the fact that every cluster would ultimately receive the intervention probably made this a socially appealing design. But perhaps more importantly, the stepped wedge design allowed a randomized evaluation in a setting where probably without this design, there wouldn't have been a randomized evaluation. So in summary then, stepped wedge trial design is becoming an increasingly common type of trial design, but it's likely to have much greater risks of bias compared to the conventional parallel cluster randomized design. And so for this reason, the consort extension for stepped wedge trials requires that investigators provide a clear justification for choosing the stepped wedge trial. And so what we're doing here is arguing that its mere popularity and novelty shouldn't be used um, as a factor in its adoption. So in situations where the conventional parallel design is feasible, it's likely to be the preferred design. So that brings me to the end of my talk and I'm just putting a little link there to a YouTube video um, that we made trying to um, encourage investigators to think carefully before adopting this design. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hemming. Uh, a terrific presentation. Um, I have watched that video, so I, I hope others will, will look at it too. It's uh, entertaining. Um, let's move to some questions. Um, you uh, cited a number of good examples, good justifications for using Step Wedge. Can you give examples of bad justifications? or questionable justifications? I, the, the worst one has to be the, the ethics, I think. Um, I think we're seeing um, that used less and less. A um, number of people, um, a number of papers ha have outlined why that's not a great um, justification. Um, other um, bad justifications, um, probably the staggered rollout um, I think probably it's not very well appreciated that the cluster randomized design can also be staggered. So that's probably the second one. That the parallel design can also be staggered. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we did that in the Minnesota Heart Health Program back in 1980. So long time ago, it's not, it's not a new idea, uh, but I agree with you, a lot of people don't appreciate it. Yeah, it's not new and it's, it's people do it sort of implicitly and don't even report that they're doing it but agree it's, it's, it's common um maybe because the stepped wedge trial became more popular people started to forget almost that you could do the parallel design like that mm -hmm. um when thinking about whether a parallel or a step wedge uh design is appropriate is it is is it important to think about how many clusters you have does that matter? I think it does. It is an important consideration, um, but it's also very hard because you tend to find that in the setting where you have got a very limited number of clusters, if you implement these conventional power calculations, you might find that you can't achieve 80 or 90%, whatever your desired power is under a parallel design, but you can under a stepped wedge design. So then in those small cluster settings, it then seems to become appropriate to say, well, I'm going to do a stepped wedge trial design because I can't get my 80 or 90 percent power with this few clusters. And I've done that myself. But at the same time, in that setting of only having a small number of clusters, you are making assumptions when you come to analyze your stepped wedge data that seem to be they have a very high bar. All of these clusters have to follow the same secular trend. And if you think about how some stepped wedge trial designs have been conducted, maybe over 10 different countries, that assumption seems very questionable. So that's a tricky one. Uh, we have a number of questions asking uh, whether there are 
online calculators for doing sample size calculations for step wedge designs or uh, software that, that you can purchase that would let you do those kinds of calculations. Can you uh, comment on that? Yep. Um, so I think um, the NIH has a page, I think, where it um, has some resources for sample size calculations. Um, Jim Hughes has also published an R code that will do these calculations. Um, and then myself and Monica Taliad and a few others published an R Shiny app um, that will do these calculations. And I think that um, a group of people have published a review where they've reviewed all the different possible um, implementation options for these sample size calculations. But I think that's um, under review at the moment. Thank you. Um, and you're, you're correct, NIH does have a website uh, called research uh, or resources, uh, res uh, uh, research methods um, uh, resources, uh, we call it RMR for short, uh, that includes a step wedge calculator. And I'll ask Dr. Morier to put that link in the Q&A box so that people can have it. Um, and we have used your Shiny app and, and found it uh, to be uh, terrific. And in fact, we uh, used it as we were evaluating our own calculator and uh, comparing notes and uh, making sure that they were reasonably in agreement. Um, can you say uh, more about strategies for uh, adjusting standard errors for within cluster correlation? Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of work on that recently. Um, Jess uh, Kayser and Andrew Forbes and Fanley um, are, I guess, just three of the people that have led on that, and there have been others. What they have essentially um, tried to allow for is that when you think about a stepped wedge trial and the observations are collected in cluster periods, then we tend to all readily um, accept that observations within the same cluster will be more highly correlated than observations in different clusters. But we also have now started to realize that observations collected in the same cluster period will be more highly correlated than, correlation, than observations collected in different cluster periods. So you allow for some sort of decay over time. So observations collected further in time are less highly correlated than those collected close in time. Um, and there are a number of different ways for doing that, both at the power stage and at the analysis stage. You noted that um, uh, a parallel uh, group randomized trial that has a small number of clusters should be analyzed with K minus two degrees of freedom in a t-test. Should we also use the T distribution when calculating sample size, especially if the preliminary result uh, is a small number of clusters? And, and not sure what the upper bound of that small number might be, but uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think back in nineteen was it nineteen seventy. So 1974, when um, was it Cornfield published um, the first paper on cluster trials, he said that there were two things that we had to worry about in cluster trials. The first one was the clustering and the second was the degrees of freedom correction. And it seems to me like um, everybody took note of the clustering part. So most investigators now allow for clustering in their sample size and their analysis. But hardly anyone appreciated this uh, degree of freedom thing. And I think there have been a couple of reviews, including your own, David, that have shown that w when investigators have a small number of clusters, and remember most cluster trials have less than 40 clusters anyway, hardly anyone implements these degree of freedom corrections. So I think they're more important at the analysis stage. But if you don't consider them at the power stage, well, you'll be underpowered when you get to the analysis stage. And it's also that if you don't appreciate it at the design stage, you're probably not going to appreciate it at the analysis stage. So yes, at the design and analysis stage, we should all be thinking about these degree of freedom corrections. Uh, I certainly agree. Um, do, does the step wedge design require that initial period of uh, 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 
call it a baseline period where none of the clusters received the intervention but we're collecting data. Is that necessary or can you just jump right in and have the first sequence start with intervention? I think you can I think it can jump right in. I don't think there's any reason why you can't. Um, there are different parts of the design that are that give you more power. Those tend, tend to be the bits along the diagonal and also the bits in the corner. So I think if you did just jump straight in um, without that first baseline period, I think you might lose. It might be quite inefficient, I think. Um, but um, I think mostly that that baseline period is is good to sort of like get everything working. And I can't see a sort of logistical reason why you wouldn't want that first period. Uh, is a purely randomization based analysis uh, for um, a cluster randomized trial practical or do we always have to use model based results? Um, I think purely randomized based approaches are pretty rare. Um, but they tend to, they, I think they're quite safe. Um, but I think people don't like using them for their own trial because they do have an impact on those confidence intervals. They're, they, they're data greedy. They're not the most powerful um, type of test, but they're the safest type. Um, few people use them. Um, they have been evaluated in step to edge trials. So Jennifer Thompson um, and maybe others have evaluated those and they work well. I, I remember Mitch Gale's work um, years ago uh, looking at uh, randomization tests in uh, the parallel uh, group randomized trials context. Uh, quite safe, um, and uh, these these kinds of randomization tests are much easier to do uh, these days with fast computers. Uh, yeah, I guess the one tricky thing is that it's not always easy to get confidence intervals. And I've done it once. And getting the confidence interval out, getting the treatment effect out and the and a p value or test statistics fine, but getting a confidence interval was an effort. Uh, I, and I agree. Uh, you've shown us that adjustment for time was important in a step wedge trial. Is it also important in a parallel trial? I don't think so because parallel designs are balanced on time, um, especially a parallel design with just a single post randomized measurement. So that's balanced on time. I think you might, if you did adjust for it, if you had a small number of clusters, I think it would increase your power probably just like how any covariate adjustment tends to increase your power, but I don't think it's necessary. I don't think you'd get a biased estimate of the treatment effect. If you didn't adjust for time. Uh, some people argue that a step wedge design is preferred over a parallel design because everybody gets the intervention. Um, but those trials often take longer than the corresponding parallel design. Um, so it seems like you could actually provide the intervention in the control arm in a parallel design uh, earlier than everybody would get it in the step wedge design. Uh, am I missing something? Um, I think which design takes longer depends on the particular setting. And although when you draw out a stepped wedge trial, it always looks longer on a piece of paper, it sort of it depends on how big the cluster is. So if you need to have a very large cluster size and it's a um, an incident condition, it can take you a very long time to just accrue that number of observations, even in a parallel design. So I think that stepped wedge design always takes a longer duration. It's a bit of a myth. Um, I think it depends on the setting. Um, but if you're adopting it because you think that everyone should get the intervention, I think that goes to the last point that Richard Hooper was making. Well, if everyone, if you want everyone to have it, why are you why are you testing it in a in a randomized design? Good point. Um, what about uh, patterns of intervention effects over time? Um, it seems like the step wedge design assumes that the intervention uh, effect occurs and then maintains in a steady state over time. But in, a lot, in an awful lot of interventions, uh, uh, we see 
uh, in individual level uh, studies, in parallel studies, intervention effects building over time and then declining later, not, not holding at a steady state. Uh, how does a step wedge design deal with that kind of pattern? So, um, sort of bluntly, in the main type of analysis approach, the analysis that Hussey and Hughes suggested in 2007, we make the assumption that there's a common effect of the intervention across all of the clusters and also that it's common across all of the time periods. Now, I think that assumption is probably um, reasonable to most people because they can be reasonably happy in estimating the average effect. Well, what is the average effect across the entire time period? At the same time, the step wedge trial does give you that data to allow you to estimate the time by treatment effect. So if there is an interaction, if it does have a very um, strong effect to begin with, and then perhaps it starts to wane, the stepped wedge design is beneficial because it will allow you to estimate that. Um, some recent work has suggested actually though that um, if the intervention effect does vary across, the t across time, then the average effect might be misleading. I could certainly see that, especially if the intervention effect builds for a while and then declines so that the average might still look good, but at the end of the day, there's not all that much difference between intervention and control. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, you made a point that um, uh, the usual analysis for step wedge assumes that there's a common, I think I, think I heard this, a common time trend in all the clusters Yep. And that may not be tenable, uh, you noted. Um, I think you said we couldn't test that assumption. Um, is, is that because time is modeled categorically uh, in the analyses that you described? I'm thinking yeah. to uh, uh, an older paper uh, in a parallel group randomized trials context with repeated measures where uh, modeling time is continuous allowed for heterogeneity in the cluster specific time trends and I, I I I haven't seen that in the step wedge context I wondered if you have or if you've thought about it you're right it that is the common secular trend is under the assumption of a categorical time effect if you are able to assume that the effect of time is linear or has another continuous form, but a form that you can parameterize without using categorical time points, then you do have enough degrees of freedom to model different time effects um, across the different clusters. But you end up making one of two assumptions. Either you assume um, categorical effects across time, so any sort of like nonlinear pattern, but that nonlinear pattern is the same across all clusters. Or you can assume that each of the clusters has a different circular trend, but it follows a, a linear pattern or a, a some sort of like parametric nonlinear form, but it has to be parametric. Mm -hmm. Um, for one last question, and I uh, apologize to everyone listening that we haven't been able to get through nearly all of the questions. Um, a very in interested and involved audience today, uh, Dr. Hemming. Um, uh, this question from the audience, it seems that uh, the presentation is focused a lot on efficacy trials, and the person is asking, um, can you also use step wedge in implementation trials? Yeah, definitely. Um, step wedge trials are often used in implementation trials, but there I'd say it's the same thing. You want to have some sort of intervention that's going to help people implement whatever good practice it is that they should be implementing, but you still want to test whether that implementation um, procedure works. And so many of these issues that arise are still issues when you're trying to evaluate implementation. Well, I thank you very much for your presentation and for addressing these questions. I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Moyer to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray, and uh, thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. On the Mind the Gap website, prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap, you will find several resources for this talk, including the slides and a list of references. 
We will also be posting a recording of today's webinar on our website in the next two weeks. Uh, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording when it is available. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.